And before I start, I, I, I mean, I love the chat. Please keep the chat going. Let's make this exciting. And it's so nice to see so many friends in the audience. And I want to make a special shout out to Elia and the, um, the whole team who created the Storyteller book. So if you haven't heard about the book, maybe have a look at it. Um, I, I, maybe we put the link on the chat. But if people are interested in some of the stories from last year's Storytellers, it's, um, I think it's a, it's a beautiful, beautiful read and a great effort by the team pulling this together. So thanks for that. And off we go. So I want to thank firstly Rhea, Tim, the whole uh, Teal Around the World team for making this again possible for all of us. And I really hope people had a very memorable time together during the summit so far and that you all feel ready and excited to step out there into the world and do even more good. Because I strongly feel also with the context of the war we really need it. We need to step up to do more. And it was on this on this note, it was exactly one year ago that I told you that Teal is wrong. And it was funny because some accused me of not understanding it. Many suggested I was disrespectful to the author. But that said, most said, well, hi, that's an interesting perspective. Let's talk. And I really want to thank all those people who talked with us, because as a result, we're now coming back after a year with our very first ideas as to how to evolve from where we left it last year. And we really want your help to take it further. And by the way, if you missed last year's summit, you might want to have a look at the recording, which is also on our website, as in many regards, we will build on that story further. So some of the concepts are relevant. But let me also be clear on what I will not try to do, do today and what Antoinette and I will not try to do today. We're not trying to convince you to abandon Teal. This is not an ideological yes or no debate. It's an invitation to continually evolve our collective thinking for the common good. And there are lots of good ideas out there that we need to bake into our thinking. So our ob objective is just to trigger your curiosity, your critique, your excitement. And I want to also warn you, the slides that you will see are an absolute first. We finished them yesterday evening and they're only here for you. We'll probably not do them again. And it's an intellectual tool that force as always with, with us because we really want you to see some of the things that we're seeing and help us then to move it forward. So there's lots of stuff that is not finished or polished. So kind of here's the deal. Please, please, please don't let us be the only ones to put ourselves out there. Share advice, comments, ideas, objections, whatever comes to your mind on the chat. Let's make the session interactive and exciting. If we run out of time, which we probably will because we've got too many slides, we will pick it up in the lounge. So where are we? A year after last year, and I hate to say so, but in spite of all of us trying hard, despite countless restructurings, agile transformations, government interventions, yoga classes, in spite of that famous declaration that Teal was here in 2014 and that capitalism was dead in 2019, 2020, it seems many of our organizations are still more suffering machines than wellsprings of well-being. Mental and physical health in the workplace have decreased almost everywhere in the world. Here in the UK, 74% of the working population says it is stressed out. And our organizations continue to produce numerous outcomes that nobody really wanted. Burnout, loneliness, inequality, hunger, ecological deterioration. And sadly, when people ask us about what are these good organizations, we often find it much easier to provide examples of bad organizations. There are big companies like Amazon avoiding taxes. There are people who are exploiting their employees, if not even killing them. There are big companies that are continuing to damage the ecology. And even companies that continue to reject the accountability for immoral activities on large platforms, even when lives are at stake. So maybe no surprise that in a recent survey, 56% of global citizens suggested that capitalism does more harm than good. But we brought us here, right? And this is where we always say it's not spiral dynamics. There's no kind of mean green, which is disappearing towards steel. If we take a closer look, we can see that our economy has been drifting on very dangerous currents for quite a while. And certainly not just from a collectivist green towards a conscious teal, from being mainly focused on public interest two centuries ago to explore new territories, build public roads, provide critical services, we moved towards family enterprises and private entrepreneurs who still were very careful in balancing private and public interests. Those famous honorable merchants 
to eventually craft ever larger global corporations who ended up in cementing that absolute aristocracy of shareholders and their interests. And today we ever more often see corporations pulling all those stops, including the sensible ones, to please their feudal patrons, perpetuating wasteful consumerism to lure, to lure consumers, exercising monopoly power on their platforms against competitors, exploiting employees, suppliers, finite resources, and nature, or seeking to influence national governments in the single-minded pursuit of ever faster growth. And as Henry Minsberg said yesterday, the ideology of growth is that of a cancer cell. And at the same time, we're living that inversion of the so-called principal agency relationship through an increasing financialization of the economy, where investors, which are shareholders, do not any longer care about the businesses they own as going concerns, but simply seek to extract maximum private return on their invested capital. And here it's interesting because I don't know you, but I often encounter people who are very clever people who tell me very earnestly not to worry because technology will save the day. And frankly, that makes me even more worried because I strongly believe that technology very often unwittingly amplifies what is already in our minds. As Steve Jobs once quipped, robots don't have dreams. If we forget our own humanity, how can we expect our robots to cherish life? Technology is always what we make of it. It can unleash unimagined opportunities, but also harvest the specter of ever more suffering. And if you ask Antoinette, the signs that technology is being abused to increase sufferings are there, and they're palpable. So rather than being threatened by those long shadows of power-hungry bureaucrats, we could find ourselves exploited not by nasty bosses, but by not so intelligent data-driven algorithms. And it seems many of our colleagues and certainly us on this call, we know that in spite of that cacophony about new normal and new purpose, an increasing amount of people is willing to jump ship for more meaning, more humanity, more aliveness at work. Like the Renaissance in those Italian city-states in the 16th century brought that visceral desire to feel alive after the dire years of the plague, this YOLO, you only live once, wave is rushing towards us with force. And I think we'd better listen. And as you can see on the slide, which hopefully creates a few smiles, purpose washing is not enough. It became fashionable for global corporations to come out and declare how they had eventually found proper meaning deep inside themselves. And you got all sorts of corporations today competing for the most glamorous purpose statement in millennial file branding campaigns. So construction companies are providing people with tools to build a better world. Our advertising behemoths are claiming that they take care of the world's information for all of us, not for their advertising benefits. And fashion retailers, I saw this recently, are handing out be kind t-shirts. But the problem is, in spite of all this rhetoric, most companies are still often willfully sidestepping the needed deeper reflection about the true purpose of business. And only when there's public outrage do the captains of industry suddenly profess their eternal loyalty to humanistic values and, and uh, of course, voluntary initiatives to clean up the mess they created in the first place. That is not enough. Hence, I'm very sorry to say that and to be the party pooper on this wonderful conference. Like last year, I'm with Greta. We must continue to think how we can accelerate positive change. And again, not only as uh, teal dots in an orange world, we have to step beyond ourselves and come together and synergize and create a movement for good. As Joost de Bloch already said last year, this is also about politics. We need to reintegrate our economy to serve our humanity. And we need to find ways to really operationalize positive purpose inside our organizations and importantly, inside the wider system. And I believe we probably all have been here too. We tried to stop the suffering, but failed. So we started with one big question at heart, our inquiry. How can we breathe more life into organizations? And here we are equipped with a lot of golden nuggets of knowledge. We now stand here to present our first insights to build and jam good organizations. But as Otti said, we need you. We needed to do it together. Today, 
we will present six ideas that we believe are important for good organizations. The first is about the real purpose of organizations. What makes a good organization? Not purpose washing. Second, we will look at how organizations be can become excellent by operationalizing their purpose. Then we will present our new theory of the firm. We will look at how we can build good practices that re-enable flourishing and force a deep dive in what we call institutions. How do we need to update our corporate governments and our organizational blueprint? Fifth, we will see what all that means for leadership. And finally, we will try to understand how to accelerate change, or I could also say start the revolution in organizations, but also in society at large. You can tell um, how limited our slide building and uh, Zoom skills are. This uh, entrance should have come with music and rock and roll, but just imagine it in your mind. So we, we try to create a joyful theme. The, building on what, what Antonia just said, of course, we are also building on Teal because we love many of the ideas that are in Teal. So in terms of purpose, we want to enhance that concept of evolutionary purpose with ethics because we do believe Russian red is not as good as Danish green. There are differences. You cannot just say every color has its own logic. No, that doesn't work. You need to make a stand for what is right in this world. And there's not always an excuse to say we shouldn't say that is good because we make someone bad. Sometimes it is the right thing to make someone bad. In terms of motivation, we will suggest flourishing is not quite enough. We will introduce the idea of the good life, eudaimonia. And then from, as Anshan had said, from an organizational perspective, there's a lot of focus on self-management. And we want to go beyond self-management as an end where it's all about liberation of the individual and introduce that notion of an entrepreneurial community where people thrive together. And in order to do that, we will introduce something that we've called the VPI plus model. So it sounds very sexy. So hopefully kind of we will give you some glimpses of what a new real integer coherent theory of the firm could look like, which helps us to also look at some of the teal practices, but also build on others like sociocracy and so on. And as Anshanet said, we also will look at new ways to improve corporate governance um, because there's a lot going on from B Corps to the economy of the common goods to ESGs uh, and the stakeholder theory and so on. So we need to look at what can we pick up from there that will make us stronger. And um, um, we need to look at the boundaries of the firm. What are the boundaries? How much should corporations get involved in political debates? And finally, to the note, notion of the transformation, the revolution, in teal, or rather in spiral dynamics, you have this dangerous assumption that consciousness automatically grows. So consciousness will go up and paradise will happen. And par pardon me, I'm provocative as always. But the problem is that is not happening. If you don't need to look at the war in Ukraine to understand that there's still a lot of energy in the old system. So we need to think without being deterministic, how can we create systemic nodal interventions to accelerate both the return, the, the, the increase in consciousness, but also um, better institutions. But before we go anywhere else, a quick introduction, because whilst Rhea said uh, there's no introduction needed, I want to kind of um, do a little bit of an introduction because I sometimes have the feeling we're running behind people in these discussions who do not necessarily have a clear track record. They might have done a TED talk or something, but they might not really be knowing what they talk about. So I want to introduce Antoinette, um, not only as a very, very successful academic, but as a, a typical academic, because Antoinette is working very transdisciplinary, which is something that in academia is not always um, well received, going across many, many different disciplines. And she's also an engaged scholar, which means she's working with people like me, trying to actually make sure that we don't only talk about stuff, but we make it happen, right? And, um, and uh, I would say, from a personal perspective, I also would uh, would say and uh, appreciate much that Antoinette is a bit of a rebel. I think uh, she's getting into difficulties with many of her peers because she's speaking out about what is wrong and where companies still fail to attain human-centric organizational methods, especially in HR, where Antoinette, of course, is uh, a Stefan, a Stefanie on this call knows one of the top HR thinkers in Europe. 
Well, and uh, why should you listen to Otti? But I mean, everybody knows Otti in that talk here already. But let me just um, highlight a few things. Well, first of all, um, he has 20 years plus coal face experience in actually trying to make organizations better and that in large and complex Fortune 500 businesses since he started his first company at the age of 20. Secondly, experience not only from management, but also coaching and active experimentation. And that came handy also for that um, talk, I can tell you. And thirdly, he brings immense curiosity and grit to this inquiry. And that is highly needed, as you will soon find out. The real point is we don't have any books to sell. We don't have any consulting to sell. We haven't got a coaching company. We're here because we believe what we are talking about at Teal is necessary. And a year ago, right after the Teal conference, we took out a sabbatical. And my, my, my dad was looking at me and said, you're absolutely mad. <laughs> but we decided to put 18 months of our lives away to go on an inquiry to figure out how to make organizations good. Because it matters, because in these times, organizations are those actors beyond politicians and academics who can really drive change. And that gives us a beautiful opportunity to bring organizations back to what they can be, beautiful enhancers and multipliers of human creativity for the common good. And um, the other thing maybe that makes us a little bit um, interesting for you is we had hundreds, if not thousands of discussions with many, many people around the world to integrate thoughts from everywhere. And uh, Henry is asking on the chat, um, do we have any examples for G Corps because there are examples in Teal? Um, that's a very good question. We are looking for examples. But the problem with Teal, and that was part of the critique last year, is Frederick has subjectively asked, uh, presented uh, 20 or so, I think a dozen of uh, case studies. Actually, if you look at those case studies, many of those companies would not describe themselves as Teal, and there's very little coherence in those case studies. So it's very difficult to find a coherence in the organizations to look at. But let's let's start. So yeah, our first idea is about purpose. Why are we and our organizations really here? Yeah, and it goes directly to the purpose washing that we, we showed earlier. And if you remember last year, when we talked about a better version of Teal, we focused on the concept of aliveness. We said we need to look at how we create positive energy in companies. And we presented a heat map to look at different methodologies and how much energy they can unleash. And very much this was based on positive organizational scholarship and the notion of thriving, which is a combination of feeling alive and learning. But then, um, and I think this strongly resonates with Teal. But when we looked at all the research on flourishing, mainly from positive psychology, we quickly realized that there was something missing in it. And maybe kind of, let's see if we can do a little experiment here. Um, what do you think this number is? 100,000. You might be surprised, but you know- The number this of is... thoughts we have each day. Ah, no, Patrick, very nice, the number of thoughts. The, <laughs> it actually is the average amount of hours that we all work during our lives. Try to do the calculation. So we are investing 100,000 hours in our lives in work, right? And uh, when we talk about the notion of purpose and given the kind of music theme, we thought, well, maybe one way to look at purpose is to try a metaphor, right? So what would our work be if we try to translate it into music, into a song? So question for everybody on the chat. Think about Monday morning, during three days after the beautiful conference, you're back at work, you're at your desk. What type of song does your work represent for you? Rose, very Rose nice. Is nice. <laughs> well, sunshine. sunshine. Well, you guys are ah. already there. We, we're talking to the wrong audience. Yeah, I see that. Um, yes. but maybe we show them the song you have chosen. Oh, here we go with uh, <laughs> our... Yeah, so uh, Otti yeah. was all for Friday, and of course I was from Imagine. Ah, no, not really. But um, can you tell the difference between the songs? I think the, the, the interesting thing if you use these metaphors is they tell you something. So when we, when we looked at the differences in songs, 
we ask ourselves why most people would say Imagine is the most um, the most beautiful song in the world. You have some statistics, and the Friday song is actually the most the dumbest song in the world based on some of the statistics you find. And the question is, why is that? Because if we believe in teal, let's say the Friday song comes from a red organization. Imagine John Lennon, they come from a teal organization. So they should be good enough in their own right. But there's something which we can sense and feel in regards to why they are not equally good. And I mean good in a, in a moral sense. And here we go. The biggest question I think that comes through in the search on flourishing, but also in comparison of metaphors is, there is a question about what the flourishing is for. What is human life about? It cannot be just about pleasure and energy of flow. There needs to be an element of purpose in terms of our contribution to something greater, some sort of qualification of whether our purpose is humanly good in regards to what pure humanity is all about. And the song can be better or worse or ethical or unethical. And we can all see and feel, I think, that difference. So when we looked at this a little bit more deeply, it was very interesting when we spoke to Stefano Zamangi in terms of what economics was originally meant to be. And it turns out that in the 18th century with people like Adam Smith, economics was never meant to be an independent discipline. It was something that was sandwiched between philosophy, which is all about what the human life is for and politics which is all about what a good society is. And in that context, our economic activities were, were, were just one expression of human life, but they always had to fulfill a number of uh, boundary conditions and enabling conditions in terms of the legitimacy, organizations are created by society, therefore they must serve sustainably the society they stem from. Otherwise they betray their mandate, so to speak. And at the same time, what they do must fulfill an even higher purpose of human life expressing the aliveness that we have we all have and of course there's a viability condition um, in terms of profitability of the enterprise but we often end up with only the profitability uh, condition and everything else get, gets bolted on and i would claim that of these three conditions sustainability viability and responsibility we know least about moral responsibility so we spend a lot of time reading very, very complicated texts and talking to philosophers to understand what is good, what constitutes a good action. In this context, and I think you heard that already last year, we can discern three grand theories of ethics. So theories about how to act well. There are utilitarian ethics. An action is good if the net consequences, the net utility is good for the majority. There's the ontology. Here an action is good if it follows rational rules and laws. And finally, there's virtue ethics. An action is good if it is based on virtues and supports a good life. Or in other words, an action is good if the actor is good. And we will go there in a second and explain it a little bit more. So how does this relate to our first question of purpose? Well, you might sense, like with the song, and what perspective we take on what is good really makes a big difference. With utilitarianism, for example, we very often justify still our pursuit for our own freedom and self-interest, or simply a drive for more profit, because we conveniently do not include all stakeholders in our calculations, let alone future generations. Or we can justify lots of bad things as long as we do a little more good. That's the idea of net zero or net positive. And really, it's a typical business case. The problem with deontology, on the other hand, is also uh, that we know from a lot of research that rules crowd out the very predisposition of an actor to act ethically. Think minimum standards and compliance. Before we know it, we just do the minimum to tick the boxes and pass the controls, abdicating our moral accountability to think for the whole. And that's why we happen to believe that virtue ethics might be our best options. So what's that all about? And that's actually now um, on that slide. Well, it stands out for two things. First, the purpose of life, it's telos, is life itself. Life giving activities that never become an end to something else. It's, it's really about leading a good life, to enact our highest potential as human beings and to flourish what Aristotle called eftemonia, which literally translates guardian angel. So leading a good life is always a process, not an outcome. 
we become by doing, and that's going to be very important. Virtue ethics is also very practical as it gives us some ideas how to reach it. It first puts the cultivation daily of character, virtues and wisdom at its center. Second, it stresses that we are social animals, that we cannot do this on our own. Only in relation and friendship with others can we happily become human and realize our calling. And third, it sees that through this flourishing in community, we become in service for the good of all. So the short formula is act every day how you want to become, grow in relationships and be in service for. Thank so, I mean, what could be more boring than talk in a, in a management evolution conference about ethics? But trust me, I really feel this is important. If we want to do good, we need to understand what the heck good is about. And I think we have lost in many of our management conversations two and a half thousand years of ethics, of understanding as to what makes human life precious and what it means to become our very best. And we might have different opinions about it, but at least we should know what people have thought about this stuff, because frankly, there's nothing new under the sun. And what this means for us is if we take this virtue ethics, which is the, the beauty about virtue ethics is also it's, it's not prescriptive. It focuses on the character of the actor. We become our best. It's not telling us this is right and this is wrong. It's how can we become our best, but as Antoinette says, in community. And what does it mean for the organizational purpose? So here on this slide, basically, if you compare to last slide, what we've added is the, legit the legitimacy condition. So an organization must serve the society and the common good because without the societal blessing, it couldn't even exist. So there's a requirement for a company to consider sustainability. But the second aspect is that of the good life. There's a question about is our acting every day nourishing work as an end in itself because life cannot be sold, never. It is about flourishing in the moment. And I think that might not be the conversation you can easily have in a boardroom, but it's probably the sentiment we should have at heart whilst we're going through our daily activities. Am I doing this one? <laughs> Until then, I think you say yes. Okay, so um, if I'm doing this one, which then, so we can take this to define what in our, what a G Corp is, what a global, what a good organization is, right? So it is, it is an organization that has the good life as the ultimate sense-making always at heart. Secondly, that treats the good life not as an outcome. It's not a product. It's not at the end of something. It's in the moment. It's here. It's how we interact. It's how we do things, right? Becoming something together. That's what, so it is investing in routines and habitual activities to bring eudaimonia, the good life into everything we do. And it's doing so sustainably at different levels for the individuals that form part of the organization, for all the communities that it touches and for the wider world as an actor. And as we will see in a second, it also needs to redefine the boundaries of the firm, not just based on how much profit it can make, but on how much value, how much life it can create. And that's a completely different paradigm if you think about it. So you're looking for opportunities to bring the world to life. And that's really what needs to be part of the good organization or the G Corp purpose. And here maybe, before we go into the theory, and I need to watch the time because we've got so many slides for you guys, we're gonna, we're gonna hop over a few because all of this is there for you to take apart if you want to. But what goes with this notion of bringing the life, bringing the music back, it feels like Blues Brothers, so bringing the band back together, bringing the music back into the day-to-day -day activities, that is what Aristotle calls excellence. And as we see here, most companies have separated the production from the flourishing. And I think that is something that is intrinsic in the idea of, in the idea of Teal, but here I think we're making it, it, it even more tangible. So every company has a production process, what Aristotle, Aristotle would call poesis, and it has a flourishing process, what Aristotle would call praxis. And the, the challenge is to bring these two back together, to reunite them, to create the flourishing tree. And the companies that do that well are called excellence. It's not just about outcomes. It's about how you enable work to become end in itself. And I think, so we go back and forth because we've done endless discussions and research. So here we're going back to positive organizational scholarship, Jane Dutton and many others who have, involved, have been involved here. And we look at research to understand when we talk about excellence, kind of what type of companies 
are achieving the very right of this of this graph, which are the kind of positive deviant outliers. And it's quite, it's uncanny because what turns out is that Aristotle was probably right. Because you can tell when you find these excellent companies, not by looking at the balance sheet, by, but listening to their stories. Because rather than talking about uh, revenues, they will start to talk to you about compassion, about courage, about caring, about how they interact with each other and can trust with each other and how they grow together. So you can tell, like the song that we had at the beginning, the difference between an excellent company and one that is simply instrumentalizing work and its workers for kind of um, external ends. And here we go to the notion of virtues because that's exactly what Aristotle said. Virtues are not values. It's not a PowerPoint. It's not a post in the cafeteria. Virtues are habitually enacted behaviors that form character traits at individual and collective level to make us become the best possible vision of ourselves. Every time you act, you open a window of potentiality. The next sentence you say, the next action you take, you've got a choice. Do you want to act in such a way that you become the vision of yourself or do you want to just go like an automaton and do what tasks are on the, on the, on the rooster? And here, what we are trying to do, and there are many, many suggestions in terms of what these virtues are, and I think there's some studies that they go across countries and so on, but we feel there are different types of virtues. There are virtues that help you to become, to develop yourselves, and we will come to a theory about self-development in a second. There are virtues that relate how you interact, so the famous uh, kind of um, emotional intelligence. There are virtues that are needed to create those productive communities and what is called practice, and Antoinette will explain it in a second, to really operate and then those are civic virtues, societal virtues almost. And finally, there's something that enables you to transcend yourself and look proactively for ways to serve, to love, to make the world good. And those things are virtues because you practice them day after day after day and they're difficult. So the, the, the test for a virtue is it's what your, your, your own self on the deathbed looking back would recognize as good in what you've done. It's also what is terribly difficult for you to do at the moment, right? If you have these two conditions, you would be really proud about it. And so would everybody else. And it's kind of this Ben Zander, you remember, the only measure of leadership is shiny eyes. What creates shiny eyes? Aristotle talks about beautiful good in the same word, because we know what good is. We don't need an intellectual debate about it. There's something which we sense about human goodness because we are evolutionary primed to detect it. Mm -hmm. And the, the second aspect is, Again, habituation. We are, we become what we do, as Aristotle said there. And here I need to rush. The, what I found very nice about the theories we found, bringing together positive psychology, teal with um, philosophy, is they frame this. They frame this in the form of resources and goods. So they say a good company, an excellent company, is one that balances external goods. So the things that we all know from profit to reputation to status to whatever is external to ourselves. And these are means to an end and internal goods. An internal good is always a means in itself. You're not doing it to do something else. You're doing it because it's valuable in itself. And it starts to bring these things on almost like a balance sheet so that you can develop um, governance behind both external and internal good. And mm -hmm. we think if you look at teal practices, this could be a concept that helps us to make that makes it much more much more concrete. But let's see how we operationalize um, excellence in organizations. Here's the next idea, um, what is called practices. You're on mute, I think, answers. Here, it really got hairy, to say the least, because um, you can imagine if you talk to philosophers, they have no clue whatsoever how organizational life really looks like. Whilst if you talk to organizational designers, they think almost nil about ethics. So again, lots of reading and pondering on our side, uh, must be more than 100 articles. But finally, um, we came to the resolution that this could be a model um, built on the idea of service and experimental learning, a model composed of three elements which enable the infusion of daily work with virtues, as Otti just told you. It will be about experimentation with self-management and more, as I'm going to tell you, reflection, much more reflection for development and caring for a virtuous community. 
Now let me walk to you through this and also pick up Henry's question, practical practices. <laughs> so experimentation at its core is about the quest to turn every little task into something more meaningful and virtuous. Whilst you know many of these practices on this slide, I reckon from Teal, I would still like you to stress three points. First, experiment with relationships and connections. How can you reach out meaningfully to those who you, who you are serving? Second, experiment not only with decision-making, but also with ethical deliberation techniques. And third, last but not least, infuse those virtues. Ask yourself, what does compassion mean for finance or marketing? And then add the flavor. And if you do that in finance, tell us next year how you did it. Next. We also need space, much more space, dedication and concentration for systematic reflection. None of that we have in heaps at present as we are constantly in overheating modes with an attention span of a goldfish, eight seconds as we mm -hmm. all know. What is a must to take away from here? Start with regular self-reflection, journaling and mindfulness during work. Put the premise on relational reflection, case clinic, lots of feed forward conversation. And of course, last but not least for us again, integrate moral reflection, shadow moral examples, try a moral imagination technique and start asking yourself what Otti has also asked, is this beautiful? And finally, we also need to build our virtuous community. Real transformation, co-elevation is only possible if we build high quality relationships and solidarity. How? Start with calculatory trust, small dips into cold water. Then invest heavily in relational trust. For instance, by experimenting with micro practices to show emotional caring, joy, gratitude, and lots of humor, always good. And then go systemic. Have your pledge for interdependence dare to be whole at work. For only when all these three elements come together an enabling experimental atmosphere, reflection to grow, trust as well as high quality relationships, we can create this virtuous cycle, constantly pushing us and the system upwards towards becoming together our best selves. Excellence thereby becomes a continuous and a deliberate developmental process, hinging on the quality of our development, our relationships, our institutional structures and processes, and last but not least, on the moral identity of us and our community. Now this, and, and Antoinette and everybody, this is the point where I will throw the little script that I have away because we've got 18 more minutes. And I want to just show you some thoughts on what else we've got on the bandwagon and then we can pick it up um, further. But this, this slide is important because if you remember spiral dynamics, the idea is that just by consciousness, the rest will happen. What we are suggesting is that you need to activate this spiral and you activate the spiral by institutionalizing some of the practices, both in terms of self-management, but also the virtues. And you activate the spiral by nurturing a community that holds this notion of holding the organization and the people within it to grow. And you need to invest in individual development and more consciousness because it doesn't naturally is there. We will see in a second between two and five percent of people are su su suggested to be conscious at any kind of research that you can find. That's not enough. You might not need everybody. Again, you might need between 12 and 30 percent of people to be in that place and especially the leaders. But certainly it's not going to happen by itself. So the, the kind of think about the spiral needs to be helped. And I think what people very often forget is the value of institutions. And we come to that now, because in this, no, this notion of the translation of purpose as a verb, purpose as a, a kind of passionate working into a theory of the firm, the first thing is the practices. So we turn micro enterprises or teams or communities or whatever it is, we turn them into machines, so to speak, to industrialize the good life, right? Both producing what the firm wants to produce, but with a different mindset behind it. But as we all know, many people try to do that. We all try to do that. And we very often hit the wall because the institution, i.e. the organization, the management, the practices, the policies, the stock market calls at the end of the quarter come in the way of allowing us to do that. So we are reframing here. And I think that's, again, an interesting perspective. 
we are reframing, we are, we are sliding not only, we, we are dividing not only internal and external good, we're dividing the practices, the people that do the doing and help each other to flourish from the institutions. So the institutions are the structures, the governance, the leaders who have a new role. Their role is to enable the practices to develop. The second role is to integrate the practices in a meaningful way to optimize the sustainable benefit for stakeholders. And that requires strategic differentiation work. Sometimes it might even require to close some practices. It requires a different view on corporate governance where you really need to extend to new stakeholders to bring diversity into governance. You need to look at the composition of your boards, right? Who is sitting at the board? We need more core determination. We need voices that come in into this ethical deliberation process. And as I said earlier, we need to reconsider the boundaries of the firm, not only based on external good, but also internal good. And of course, all of that will only work if we have leaders who are coming to a different perspective of their role and their capacities. And we come to that in a second. But let me give you only some glances of this. What is the institution? And by the way, all of this makes the VPI model. So V is virtues. right? So it's bringing the virtues into the work. P is the, pro, the practices, turning the teams into these practices that create those spirals. I is the institution of protecting, buffering, enabling, and enhancing the work of the collective practices. Right? So it's the same as a usual organizational theory, but it takes a slightly different perspective. And the plus is the en enhancing of the value for the external stakeholders, which takes into account the new theories that are coming up. So let me just give you a few glances. Actually, Antoinette, um, the, on, the on the enabling and thwarting practices. Sorry. Exactly, very, very quickly. Um, we believe that, for instance, well, if you want to enable the practices, you need to give them the space, the time, the budget for reflection. That I think is most needed. Um, give them 10% reflection time, deep reflection coaches. Uh, another thing also for the enabling side, you finally have to create HR practices which really co support co-creation learning and growth. Instance, for instance, by ditching management by objectives and instead rely on team North Star goals or every three or four months kick a devastating instrument out and in goes a better one that is co-created, but look through your practices. And, and I can go even on the next slide a little bit more clearly, get rid of the toxic practices. Stop using minimum standards. Instead, ask for abundant solutions. Stop promoting assholes and narcissists. Make sure that your organization is growingly asshole proof and stop that budgeting madness. Start experimenting with beyond budgeting approaches. Just some examples, much more on the slides. I think um, Patrick is answering, could we could asking on the chat, could we see this as a model that creates consciousness? Yeah, not only. And we will come to that point in a second. It's not only consciousness, because we all know there's a thinking doing gap. You might even be conscious and know what the right action is, but you might not do it. So there's a there's more to it. And the doing will require some of those ethical. And again, I, as it said on the slide, ethics, some people think about churches and, and anthems and stuff. Ethics is a mediator. Morality is a mediator. It's about the boundaries or the, 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 the mediation between me, myself and I, me and others, me and the world. What is the right stance that I take in the moment so that the flourishing of everybody, including myself, is enhanced? It's not, it's not altruism, right? This is the wisdom that we will come to in a second. So there's more than just consciousness in it. But let me tell so the, the favorite topic of these organizational um, evolution meetings is always structure. And I, pardon me, but I think it's a bit of a red herring, right? Because what, what is important is the maturity and the moral character of the organization. And as Antoinette explained, that needs to be nurtured also by institutional practices, but of course, as well by the other axes of that spiral. But when we talk about organizational design, what we see is normally this picture. At its heart, organizational design is about two things. Differentiation, how do I split the organization into specialized teams or smaller teams, et cetera, and how do we reintegrate? So I get synergies, I get compliance, I get scale, whatever. Right? Those are the two things. There's no real magic about organizational design. And what you typically see is these free buckets. If you go for autonomous units, you're in a market type organization. If you go for a divisionalized structure, you're in a typical bureaucracy or hierarchy. And if you go for a homogeneity, which is enforced by informal cultural norms, then you're in a community. So let me give you an example. So on the bottom right, that's ING. We are agile, but we are a hierarchy. If you go to the bottom left, that's probably higher, 
right? So higher is probably a very market centric with internal competition, internal structure and so on. Um, top right, Bodzog, right? It's a very, very beautiful firm which based on internal norms because uh, as Gessie and others will tell you, if you are part of the community, it's all good. If you are mm -hmm. obstructing the community, you're probably out. So there are very clear norms in terms of how the organization works. And you can, what you see today is everybody's trying to go to the left. Subsidiarity, autonomy, right? We want more freedom. That's it. Liberate, throw away the bureaucracy. Gary Hemel said, bureaucracies must die. Uh, no, and they won't die. And it's not the problem. The problem is domination of power. It's not the bureaucracy. It's a very good structure. It has, it has been there for thousands of years. The problem is when people become unwise and exploit positional power over others. It has nothing to do as such with the organizational form. And what we are arguing is that, yes, we want more autonomy because we want the nurturing of the practices, but we also want solidarity. We want an entrepreneurial community that flourishes together. So you need to bring, you need to balance the desire for autonomy with solidarity and the integration, because at the end of the day, it's not about us, it's about flourishing together. And we need to step beyond ourselves both in the practices and in our kind of own ego to go into that collective space and that co-elevation space. And again, it's not collectivism. It's not, there's one way of doing it. It's a, this, the solidarity that I embrace you for who you are and how you flourish because your good life is different from mine. And I give you that space. But at the same time, my expectation is that you do the same for me and for us, right? It's a different idea. And uh, final word here, sociocracy so far is what we love most, but, but what we love most, but frankly, this space is heterogeneous because what we want is a organization that evolves based on its maturity, based on that spiral. And that could mean that in one space, in one part of the organization, you've got bureaucracy. In another, you've got markets. In another, you have teal. You've got an ecosystem. You're evolving with the capacity of the organization and the institution holds that because for growth, we need both order and freedom. So you're trying to get that funnel. And if you're at the bottom of the funnel, you need more control and safety to enable that experimentation, right? So let's not get hung up on organizational forms. Let's get hung up on that energy, that life energy that we can create. I said it's a VPI plus model. So one other thing that we're looking at, and this is by no means uh, there yet, there are many new theories that come up and we as a community need to know about them. There's something like, look it up, eco good, economy of the common good. There's, of course, ESG, and many of you will have looked at it. There's B Corp. There are 100 and 260 questions if we want to become a B Corp certified company. And by the way, one of them is to, to um, sign a declaration of interdependence. Right? That's what we're talking about, interindependence. We want independent people to step into interdependence for the good of the planet. And of course, there are SDGs, so there, and there are many more. But the question is, how can we integrate into something to enhance Teal, where we have a much clearer view who are the stakeholders the company needs to engage with? Eight minutes to go. Oh, my God. Um, and what are the kind of virtues and um, ways we want to interact with stakeholders outside the firm? All of this, as I said, will need to be enshrined in the boards and the governance of the organization, which more diversity and more interaction of um, different actors. And um, that's what we call eudemocracy. So an organization that makes the common the ultimate good life, its primary aim. So it's not only trying to do that, but whenever there's a doubt of diverse or competing priorities, what will win is the good of all. And I will just want to throw in one example here, which I quite liked. Matt Snippers at the President's Summit last month, or well, a few months ago now in Copenhagen, he talked about this in the notion of footprint, handprint, and blueprint. And I like this because what this means, good organizations look at the footprint everything they use in terms of resources or the way that they engage people and make that good. They look at the handprint, which is the products and services. They make sure the products are good. They enhance the life of the people that deal with those products. They're not producing harmful products or products that just increase consumerism. And, and this was the most interesting one I thought, is the blueprint. Organizations today cannot go it alone. They need to connect with each other and with other political or societal actors to create common good. And that extends the boundaries of the firm. So we really shouldn't design organizations as, in, as, as isolated actors anymore. We should design networks of organizations that can become a fruitful force for the future. And here, I think, given that we have very little space left, I will, Antoinette, what I will do is I will jump over this fast and then 
we will ask people to get involved in this. That's, that's more important. But what I said, leadership becomes important. And in the last tier, so if you haven't seen this, uh, again, have a look at the uh, recording. We talked about the different developmental stages of leadership. We said leaders need to bring out the feminine side and embrace those virtues that Antoinette talked about in the practice. They need to develop their consciousness. And we can see different stages in that development and how it occurs. And there are many theories that we can draw upon. But above all, at some stage, they need to go through what we call the second life of a leader, a true transformation where they go outside themselves and become actors beyond the ego and interdependent in the way that they see themselves in the world, where identity becomes relational. And only then can they come to this, what Bill Tobit calls action inquiry, where in the moment you can reflect on your actions and you understand and sense and see and feel yourself, the relationships you're in and the worldviews, the ethical paradigms and so on that kind of are out there so that you can compare. And you get to a point of what Aristotle called wisdom, so wisdom is the capacity in a contingent situation to sense the salient features of that situation, make up all the options that you have to become a good actor in the moment, and then choose and enact and, 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 and embody the, the right stance towards the system that you're in. And what we feel is that we need to enhance our leadership development process because there's a lot of focus on professional skills, on emotional skills, and even a little bit sometimes people like us on consciousness, but very little on character, very little on wisdom. And we feel that is actually the prime skill of leaders. And if we want to have a, um, a distributed leadership throughout the organization, we need to reframe the role of leaders in these institutions to become not, not commanders and controllers and not even gardeners, but stewards, caretakers of the institution and of society at large, of the common good. They are the people who don't work in the system, but on the system collectively. And if we can expand, let me just go here. If we can expand on that, we can invite ever more people into a collective deliberation process where people together take on the kind of challenges about what is good, how should we behave? What are the virtues that we stand up for? And you're creating collective wisdom. And you can think about it almost like a triple loop learning process. Again, this notion of learning where people learn together. And as Antoinette said, they have the spaces, they have the procedures, they have the skills, and they all come together. So what is shared leadership? It's nothing else but a process combined with a number of skills and, and procedures that enable the creation of moral character, moral identity. We together make up this organization and what it stands for and the good that it wants to create. Oh. So we've invested a little bit on the theory of all of this. And now the question is, can we make this happen? And can you help us? Sorry, I said, go on. No, no, I just wanted to say, because I think that's almost the most important in, in my view, we now really need to spark a revolution. And um, at present, I believe we have not enough of a theory, at least in teal. So maybe uh, we just quickly go to the next slide. We believe that we miss out three important nodal points. Many great initiatives, a lot of kind-hearted rebels out there, great teal um, conference, for instance, but we're still not well connected. And in fact, mission-driven communities might find it even harder to collaborate. So we need to weave a platform for collective impact. And I'm going to show you an example in a second. We also are picking up what uh, Otti just did, said, change the context of our organizations. Otherwise, big publicly traded companies will have a little chance to become a force for the good. And they need to become a force for the good. And we need a revolution him, a narrative, a manifestation of what we want to become. So I really want to make sure uh, to start uh, to show you our idea how to start collective impact. And for this, we introduced G-Labs, an idea we're trying around with Bosch at present. And it's a bit a copycat from ULABS, but within companies. Labs that experiment with our experimentation, reflection, and community building practices. And thereby, importantly, also reach out to other GLABs to exchange their new found standards of excellence. So if you want to um, join up, tell us. To target societal change, we came up with the idea of the Good Leadership Society. And as Otti just said, um, leadership is, sorry, lousingly often often trained and of rival quality. So our society at present is at stake. We need better leaders. Um, and hence we would uh, suggest to redefine leadership as a profession like medicine or law. 
This could answer three important needs. The need to combine our best knowledge about how to craft good organizations, making it accessible to all members. The necessity to enable and support systematic development and the requirement to enshrine, and that's probably most important, an ethos of leadership, our responsibility to be caretakers of our organizations and societies. And that needs to go in the status of the profession. Um, so finally, <laughs> thank you, we also need that um, narrative. And of course we started the narrative here, but you can see um, in order for us to be a heliotropic principle that we all aspire towards it, we need to build it further. <laughs> Here we are on the time and out. So what we hopefully have shown you is just that by combining a number of new theories with some of the wisdom that we take from Teal and from all our collective experimentations, we can develop further. We can go beyond that evolutionary purpose and play with the idea of goodness. We can look at excellence and how we bring that and protect that balance between internal and external in our organizations systematically. And we can derive a theory of leadership that is predestined to help such organizations to rise. And maybe with a society of leadership, we can even have a voice for good leadership in lobbying or in convincing companies to go into a certain way. And I think with um, that, a, a, require, a request for everybody to join and help us. Because as you've seen the rush through, there's still lots of things that need to be determined, especially on the G labs. If someone is willing to help us experiment, we are working, we are talking to Bosch to potentially um, experiment in, in their leadership program with this idea, but we need some others. Because as Antoinette said, I think the one thing everybody should take away from this talk is we have to become interdependent ourselves. We have to synergize. We have to create a movement more than we've done before because there are lots of big companies, lots of public companies, lots of other institutions out there who are not yet in that uh, positive future that we envisage. And with that, I would say, uh, hopefully we've given you a few good ideas. See you in the lounge, I think, Rhea, yes. to um, have a conversation yeah. if anyone wants. And Indeed. get in touch. Let's make this happen. And lovely yeah. to see you so, all. So Ati, there's a question. Is the slide going to be available? I just answered that um, because we still have a lot of work in process. What we could do is to have the highlights. So uh, I think that is what we could do. We kind of have a best top of the pops of the of the presentation. Thank you so much, Antoinette. And Oti, Antoinette, thank you so much for this. Um, it's nice to see how your thought has developed from last year. And it's amazing. Yeah, if, if anything is possible, it happens at Deal Around the World. <laughs> so um, with, uh, without further ado, I want to uh, invite everyone to continue the conversation. I'm sure you have a lot of questions for Oti and Antoinette. Um, we're going to move over to the Spatial Lounge, um, garden number six. If you click on the link that I just shared right now, um, it will take you directly to that uh, Spatial Chat. And let's continue the conversation. There will be no slides there. It will just be purely conversation. So let's, um, <laughs> so let's. Uh, we can bring yeah, a few slides. Then, we have a few more. <laughs> yeah. And please make sure not to miss out um, on the closing because we will have a very special closing round. So I will be doing a sweep um, just before we do a closing. So see you at the garden number six lounge. Thank you, everybody.